Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's uh, talk. The talk is titled The Ice Age Beasts of Britain with Dr. Neil Adams of Oxford's University Museum of Natural History. I'm uh, Jim Middleton, the Collections Manager for Scarborough Museums Trust, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Yorkshire Fossil Festival 2021. Uh, organised by Scarborough Museums Trust with sponsorship from the Yorkshire Coast Bid, the Paleontological Association, the Geologists uh, Association, and this festival is Northern England's biggest annual celebration of fossils, paleontology and earth sciences. So before I hand you over to Neil, I uh, just want to let you know about a couple of housekeeping rules. You'll only be able to see and hear myself and Neil during this event. The cameras and microphones of everyone else uh, will be disabled. If you have any questions or queries during this, if you use the chat function, we should, we'll have a bit of a question and answer session at the end. And if it's anything like, oh crikey, we can't see or hear you, we'll try and address that there and then. So I'd like to thank you all for turning up and I shall hand over so Neil, thank you very much. Great, thanks Jim. Hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. I certainly can, I hope everyone else can. Okay, so as Jim said, I'm Neil Adams from the Oxford University uh, Museum of Natural History and I work here in the Earth Collections, curating and cataloguing our collections of Ice Age mammals. Uh, and uh, so today I'm gonna take you on a bit of a tour through the uh, Ice Age Beasts of Britain. Uh, let's get started. So if I were to ask you to uh, think of an image uh, of the Ice Age, this is something that might come to mind. Um, big snowy landscapes covered in ice with huge mammoths uh, roaming around. Um, but as more and more fossils have been collected through the years, we've come to realise that actually it's a lot more complicated than that. There were a lot more mammals during the Ice Age and climate changed quite a lot. So there were these very cold periods but also much warmer periods. Uh, and we'll see that a, a bit later on. Uh, but you're not wrong if you were to think of uh, mammoths uh, during the ice ages. So over here on the left, uh, you can see we've got a really, really nice skull. Uh, so this is a very complete skull. I think it's the most complete skull um, of a mammoth known from Britain. And it was collected from Ilford in Essex. So it's become known as the, the Ilford mammoth. Uh, and is about a quarter of a million years old. So one of, one of our nicest uh, finds of mammoth in the UK. Uh, but we also find other fossils. So over here on the right, we've got a jaw of a juvenile uh, mammoth that was about three years old when it sadly passed away and became a fossil. Um, and these, this is one of the Shropshire mammoths that were discovered in 1986. And this is interesting because it was one of the, the latest records of mammoth in Britain. So they're from about 14,000 years ago. Um, so quite recent compared to the old Ilford mammoth over here. But we also tend to find less complete fossils. These are much more common. So we tend to find teeth. Um, they're very well preserved in mammals because the teeth are made of enamel, which is very hard and can survive in the fossil record. So actually, um, this particular fossil that I'm showing on the screen here was one that I was presented with at the Yorkshire Fossil Festival back in 2019. A school teacher came up to our stand and asked me, what's this? Uh, and um, they found it on the beach in Bridlington in Yorkshire, and it's the, an upper molar belonging to the woolly mammoth. And you can see that they've got these characteristic plates that make up the tooth surface and they're quite high crowned, all good adaptations for their grazing diets back in the ice ages. So this, this came from Bridlington, as I say, um, and this is where Bridlington is, if you're not too familiar with Yorkshire, but I'm sure a lot of you are. So this is um, Bridlington up here, um, and Bridlington Bay and Scarborough, where the rest of the fossil festival is happening just a few miles up the coast. And scientists have looked at the cliffs up by Bridlington for many years. Uh, and you can see here highlighted in blue are the, the Ice Age um, sediments. Uh, and that's almost certainly where the school pupil that found this tooth, where that tooth came from and was um, washed out onto the beach. And uh, we know what the climate was like back then because of these really long records that record climate changes through the past million years or so. Um, and we know this because ocean um, drilling has happened and they've looked at the sediments going back in time and they're able to look at the chemistry of very small fossils that we find in the ocean. And they record the temperature at the time that they were alive. And um, we can go back in time. So we're going, this is the modern day over here on the left. And we go back in time over to the right. And you can see in the kind of yellowy orange colors, we've got these warm periods in the past. Uh, and then in the blue, we've got these cold um, glacial periods. Uh, so we call the blue periods glacials and these kind of orangey warm periods interglacials. 
And so that fossil that um, was found in Bridlington probably almost certainly comes from this cold period about 50,000 years ago um, during the last ice age. And you can see we've got all these numbers up here which relate to the different stages uh, in the marine record. So we've got uh, the last uh, glacial period is from stages two to four. And you can see we're over here in stage one at the moment, the modern warm interglacial. Um, but about 125,000 years ago, we had this warm period, this very high peak uh, stage five here. And we actually have sediments of that age uh, at Bridlington as well. So highlighted in red here, underneath the ice age uh, layers, we ha also have these warm interglacial sediments. They're actually from an old, an old beach. Uh, and if we have a look at the fossils, um, so this, this deposit was dated, and it's about 120,000 years, and there have been fossils found in this old beach deposit, and one of them uh, is this rather impressive tusk that you can see at the top here. Sadly, it was lost to a fire in a museum uh, in about 1943, I think, but we still have some evidence that these straight tusked elephants, so different to the mammoth, and they were around in warm periods. Um, we found tusks, we have other tusk fragments that are still around from Bridlington, um, but we also have some other more exotic uh, megafauna. So we've got things like hippos, um, we find their teeth and parts of their rather formidable tusks that you can see down here at the bottom, as well as this extinct species of rhino. So this is the, the narrow-nosed rhinoceros, and we find um, its teeth uh, in these beach deposits at Bridlington as well. So you can see there's a very different assemblage of mammals that's known from this period before we then go into the Ice Age. Um, and there are deposits of similar age around the country, and we're going to have a look at a few of them from Yorkshire uh, and see if we find the same creatures there. Um, so one very famous example is Kirkdale Cave. So we've now travelled a little bit to the northwest, due west from Scarborough, in fact, and we're on the, the northern slopes of the Vale of Pickering. And you can see this, this, this is the modern entrance to the cave here. Uh, and it's an opening into um, late Jurassic limestones uh, on the northern edge of the Vale of Pickering. But it was excavated quite a long time ago um, by this guy. So this is um, William Buckland, and he was the first professor of geology here at the University of Oxford, actually. And he was very famous because he wrote the first scientific description of a dinosaur, which he called Megalosaurus, in 1824. Um, but a couple of years before that, he described the ice-aged mammals that were found uh, in Kirkdale Cave. Um, and it's actually 200 years ago to the year uh, in June uh, that the cave was first discovered. And you can see a little um, artist's reconstruction of the discovery of that cave. It was actually discovered by um, men working in a quarry in uh, 1821. So uh, that's what it would have looked like at the time. And William Buckland went and visited this site uh, in 1821 after it had been discovered later in that year. And this is what he saw when he got there. So this is the, a cross section through the mouth of the cave. And you can see there are uh, stalactites hanging from the ceilings and stalagmites along the floor. But critically, you can also see there are these uh, rather jagged looking things at the bottom. And those are the bones within this layer A, which is a, a deposit of cave earth. The bones were actually encrusted into the stalagmites along the floor as well. Um, so these are some of the fossils that Buckland found when he was working at Kirk, Kirkdale Cave. Um, and it was a very, very rich site. So over 1,200 fossils are known from the cave. Um, and those are fossils that we still uh, are still around today because this collection was dispersed to museums across the country and some were destroyed in World War II in London, in Bristol, in, in Hull as well. But we still have a lot of these uh, collections surviving. Um, and I've picked these, these ones here because these are specimens that are actually on display here at the Oxford Museum. So if you were to come to Oxford, you can uh, find them for yourself. Some of them are the other way around, so you, they might not look too similar, but if you were to flip it around, they're, they're the same specimen. And so, yes, at first, when Buckland found all these fossils, he thought it was, was great evidence for the great biblical flood that all these fossils, the animal remains, had been washed into the cave by flood waters. Uh, so what animals do we have here? Well, it's the same kind of thing that we found in that beach at Bridlington. So we've got, again, we've got a uh, straight tusked elephant. We've got really nice molars of a straight tusked elephant. Again, we've got teeth of narrow-nosed rhinoceros, hippo teeth as well. But by far the most abundant were the fossils of hyena. So you can see this really nice upper jaw fragment belonging to the hyena there. And it's the same, the same cast of characters that we saw at Bridlington. And again, these have been dated. Um, you can date those stalactites and stalactites and the ones that overcross the bones. Um, they have a similar age, 120,000 years ago. And so 
in the end, Buckland changed his mind and realised that actually these were probably um, the remains of a hyena den from before the biblical flood. Uh, so you can see a caricature here of um, Buckland climbing into the cave with a light uh, showing um, the hyenas munching on, on bones there. And so we, there, we know that there are about 600 hyena specimens from this cave still around. Um, and it's actually, it would have been far greater than the number that they, they found when they dug this cave out. And it's thought that Buckland estimated that there were about the remains of 200 to 300 individuals of hyenas from this cave, which is just an insane amount. And, and they're of all ages. So we've got juvenile through to very old animals. Um, great evidence that this was in fact a, a den, a maternal den for hyena. But he went further than that. So to, to prove his case, um, and you can see we've even got kind of fossilised droppings here of because hyenas crunch and eat bones. So their, their droppings are very uh, resistant and can survive in the fossil record. Um, but to prove his case that this was in fact a hyena den, Buckland, who was rather an eccentric guy, gave a cow shin bone, a modern cow shin bone, to a hyena that was actually travelling through Oxford with one of these animal shows in the, the 19th century. Um, and the gnaw marks that it made, this is the, the cow bone in question, were very, very similar to the, the gnaw marks that he saw on bison bones from Kirkdale Cave. And he also compared the droppings that he found, the fossilised droppings, to, to the genuine droppings of hyenas from this uh, travelling show. Um, so it was this kind of really careful analysis that allowed him to reconstruct what the, what the cave was like those years ago. And it was his careful analysis um, and his careful approach to reconstructing the past that earned him the, the Copley Medal of the Royal Society in 1822. Uh, so that's another site where we get this, this fauna from the last interglacial, that warm period about 120,000 years ago. But if we venture a little further to the west, and um, this time we're over in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, and there's another site there called Victoria Cave, and another historical site. And we've got some, uh, some old photographs here. Um, so this time we we're in Carboniferous Limestone as the bedrock, but caves equally well develop in these rocks as well. And you can just about see a little opening over here with lots of scree coming down the sides of the slope. And, and this is the, the mouth of Victoria Cave in the Yorkshire Dales. And it was discovered in 1838, and it was the year of the coronation of Queen Victoria, which gave the cave its name. But it wasn't excavated substantially until later on in that century. So here we are um, a few decades later, actually. And this is so this was in uh, 1870. And excavations were then uh, led by a guy called William Boyd Dawkins, who was a famous cave excavator. And in this cave, they found another hyena bone bed, very, very similar to the Kirkdale cave that William Buckland found uh, much earlier. Um, and again, they were able to date certain stalactite and stalactite layers and found the same age about 120,000 years ago. So this is what the cave would have looked like. So this is the front of the cave. And again, you can see those three slopes coming down from the front, which are these deposits over here through this uh, cross section. So this is a, uh, a cross section made in 1873 by one of the guys involved in the excavation. And it's this red layer here that had the, the bones of hyena and all those other tropical megafaunal animals, hippopotamus and that kind of thing. These are some of the remains from Victoria Cave. So hopefully you can see what's going on as I've changed the screen now. Here we go. So this is a, a 3D scan of some of the hyena remains from Victoria Cave. Uh, so this is a really nice skull. And you can see you've got this massive sagittal crest at the top of the skull where muscle attachments would have gone and that allowed the hyena to, to pulverize through bone like it was nothing at all um, a lovely specimen there and there's another another one here showing a, a really nice jawbone uh, a lower jaw left lower jaw and you can see these really massive conical teeth that are perfect for crushing through bone and you can see they, they wear completely flat because they just have uh, such extreme diets crunching through those really hard bones there. So some lovely material, again, very similar to what we saw at, at Kirkdale. So I'll just get back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So, so yes, those, those are some examples uh, from Yorkshire, from Bridlington, Kirkdale and Victoria Cave. Uh, and each of those provide a kind of snapshot of what was going on with the, the Ice Age mega beasts, if you like. But these only do provide snapshots. So ideally, we would want a record that could go further back in time and we could link different sites together to get a better understanding of, of what was going on with, with the megafauna in Britain, these really giant animals. 
Um, and that's where sites from the, the River Thames come in. So this is a bit closer down, nearer to where I work in, in Oxford. And you can see the River Thames flows through central and southern England and has done for, for a very long time. So at least a million years or so. And it's from, from the River Thames, actually, that we have a really, really great record of Ice Age mammals right back through time through the last 400,000 years and so this is a cross section now in the lower Thames near London so we've sliced through the river valley here and this is the modern river over here on the right with modern, modern river sediments here in yellow and you can see there's almost this kind of staircase up the valley side here and it's thanks to work by these two people We've got Professor David Bridgeland from Durham University, who loves trains, as you can see, and uh, Professor Danielle Shreve from Royal Holloway University of London. Um, and together they were able to piece together the history of this, um, this region. Um, David studies the, the river sediments and Danielle's an expert on the fossil mammals. And together they showed that actually there was this sequence as we go back with, with older sediments and fossils at the very top. Um, and the river progressively cut down during the Pleistocene uh, in response to those glacial interglacial cycles. And they could find distinct mammal assemblages in each of these uh, different terraces as they went down the, down the sides of the valley. So here we are, this is our climate record again. Uh, and they were able to show that down at the bottom, they had deposits of the last interglacial that we found, uh, those very similar ones to Kirkdale Cave, Victoria Cave, uh, and at Bridlington. But then as they went further back up the, the Thames, um, they found deposits of this earlier interglacial, stage seven in the marine record, and further back still to stage nine, uh, about 300,000 years ago. And then um, at the top of the lower Thames, uh, they found this deposit that from, from a warm period about 400,000 years ago. So a really good record, lots of individual sites, but we can piece them all together uh, to get a better understanding of what was happening with the fossils. And the same um, occurs at the Upper Thames near Oxford. Um, it's a slightly different um, terrace sequence, um, but the same principle occurs. You have this the younger deposits down at the bottom near the modern river, which is here, uh, and then older sediments as you step up the valley sides. Uh, and again, we have uh, stage 5E, this really warm period over here, and then stage 7 and stage 9 as we go back, uh, back in time. So I'm going to now take you to some of the sites in the Thames um, that we have wonderful collections of here uh, at the Oxford Museum. Uh, and we're going to look particularly at this place called Stanton Harcourt, which you can see here from, uh, that's the, the channel, the river channel that we'll be looking at. And then we'll go down to um, the lower terrace and look at some, some fossils from sites down there. So the first of those sites is near the village of Stanton Harcourt. It's about seven, seven or eight miles west of Oxford. And it was back in, the, back in the 90s, back in the 80s and 90s, um, there was a, a large gravel pit there that was extracting gravel for the aggregate industry. But they, as they were extracting the gravel, they got down onto older deposits and they found this river channel that was, had finer grain sediment, so it wasn't as useful for the aggregate industry, but contained lots of fossils. And so you can see um, some people working at the site. Here in the 90s, they were digging up fossils. And the excavations were led by um, Dr. Kate Scott over here and Dr. Christine Buckingham. Uh, and they discovered thousands and thousands of fossils of mammals, plants, insects, all sorts. Um, and you can see here we've got a tusk, a very nice tusk, belonging to, to a mammoth from this time period. Um, and they, we know that this, this, as we said earlier, they're from stage seven. So this is a warm period about 200,000 years ago. Um, and this is what one of those sites looked like that they were excavating. So you can see there's a drawing here um, of all the tusks and other fossils that they found um, with an interpreted flow of the river um, going up towards the northeast. So um, all these fossils were becoming entrained in the river, um, animals probably dying near the river, and then their remains being washed in um, to the River Thames. And you can see um, here we've got um, tusks in the river channel with other bones kind of backing up against them as they would have, would have clogged up the channel there. So what else do we have? Yes, so these are some more wonderful remains of mammoth from Stanton Harcourt. So you can see we've got an entire lower jaw, which is just wonderful, another huge tusk and an almost complete pelvis. So we have hundreds of individuals um, and almost complete skeletons in some cases. Um, so here you can see uh, this is a, a skeleton of, of a mammoth and there are little numbers here which indicate the number of bones and uh, teeth and skulls and things that were found. So you can see over 100 upper molars, over 80 lower molars and 200 ribs, lo loads and loads of material. 
And uh, from that material, we're actually able to estimate the body size of some of these animals. So you can look at things like the, the teeth in the jaw and also some of the limb bones. So this is a, a femur, a leg bone, uh, and, a, and a forelimb bone, an ulna here. Um, and when, when um, the researchers looked at how big these mammoths actually were, they saw that the mammoths from stage seven at Stanton Harcourt were actually quite small compared to their ancestors in the early Pleistocene millions of years ago, um, and were small also compared to the woolly mammoth. Um, so it was a different species that they found at Stanton Harcourt, uh, so the steppe mammoth, and it was a lot smaller than the, the woolly mammoth. Another interesting thing was that there were uh, more older individuals at this site. There were very few young individuals, which was also a bit puzzling because you tend to get the older individuals uh, dying in the river and then uh, being preserved. Um, and, but also you see, you tend to have younger individuals going into the river drowning um, and uh, their bones getting incorporated into the channel. So th it was quite puzzling that there weren't many juveniles. Um, so what, what the researchers thought the case was, was that actually maybe the, the smaller bones were just washed away by the powerful river. Several different reasons why the younger ones might not have been preserved in the channel. But so, but alongside these rather small steppe mammoths, we also have other sorts of elephant. So, so this is the, a tooth here of a straight tusk elephant. So similar to that elephant that we saw um, at Bridlington with that big tusk. Um, these are the teeth of straight tusk elephant, which are quite superficially similar to woolly mammoth. Um, but you can see there are slight differences. So there are fewer of these plates than you would find in woolly mammoth. And you can see that there, the limb bones of um, straight tusked elephant were much larger than the small bodied mammoth that they found. So you had this really big straight tusked elephant living alongside this rather small uh, steppe mammoth, which was quite interesting. And among the other herbivores, we have remains here of uh, red deer. We've got a, a foot bone here of a horse and um, some really lovely material of some steppe bison, so a lower jaw and an almost complete skull. Um, so if you were to reconstruct um, the different herbivores that were at the site, these are some really nice artistic reconstructions by uh, Neil Owen, who used to work here at the museum. And so you can see there was this big uh, straight tusked elephant roaming around the grasslands together with smaller bodied steppe mammoth, a rather large steppe bison and large horse uh, together with red deer, all living in this grassland together. And as well as the herbivores, um, there were also finds of different carnivores. Uh, so here we have, there was just one single bone belonging to a wolf, and this was part of its forelimb. We also have really nice jaws belonging to brown bear, an almost complete lower jaw here. Uh, and then a lovely jaw belonging to cave lion, very similar to modern lion, but quite a lot larger. So the, those herbivores would have been uh, predated by these, by these guys. Um, and so curiously, yes, the lions are particularly large during this interval, um, but the wolves and the bears are quite small. And it was suggested that actually competition between these different carnivores might have uh, forced the wolf to decrease its body size and go after smaller prey that the, the lions wouldn't have been focusing on. And obviously among the, the carnivores, we can also count ourselves, the humans. Um, so, there were finds of stone tools, such as this really lovely uh, hand axe here, uh, and other tools as well. These were, I think, scrapers, uh, so tool, different tools used for different jobs. Um, and these are characteristic of um, Neanderthals, which is a, a reconstruction of a Neanderthal here from uh, Jersey Heritage. So yes, the, the humans were also active in the landscape and would have been hunting those large herbivores alongside some of those uh, large carnivores too. So if we go back to our model of the Thames here, so we know that in stage seven um, from Stanton Harcourt, this channel here, uh, we had a straight tusked elephant together with a rather curiously small bodied mammoth um, with horse and with uh, Neanderthals. And that's a rather unique assemblage that we don't tend to see in other warm periods during the ice ages. And we find a very, very similar um, assemblage of mammals from uh, the stage seven um, deposits in the lower Thames by London, so sites like Aveley, have also yielded this combination of straight dust elephant with the small mammoth and horse and things like that. And we know from sites like Kirkdale and from Bridlington, as well as Victoria Cave, that if we go back to the last interglacial, this stage 5e, we have things like hippo with hyenas, think of the hyena den that Buckland found, uh, and also fallow deer, which were found at these cave sites as well. And that's a unique combination of Ice Age mammals that were found together um, that we don't know from other warm periods. 
So yes, this is just showing that the the, the last interglacial deposits that we see in Yorkshire, we also find down in the Thames. So we find them here in London. And actually there were excavations underneath Trafalgar Square that found very, very similar fossils to the sites in Yorkshire. And this is a really lovely canine um, belonging to Hippo that was uh, found underneath Uganda House, actually, from Trafalgar Square. And we also have uh, these kind of sites in the Upper Thames. We have uh, river channels dating back to this stage 5e. And again, we find hippopotamus remains and they're widespread across the country at that particular time, but only, only really in that interglacial uh, within the last uh, 400,000 years. So what about the cold periods though? What about that, that mammoth molar from uh, near Bridlington? So we also find cold stage deposits in, in the Thames record. So you can see all these gravel deposits alongside the red interglacial deposits are from cold climates. Um, and the same goes here. So all these black um, layers here are cold climate gravels, and they go back to stage three, this, this part of the last glacial period. So what do we find in those kind of sites? So we find, again, a rather unique assemblage. So we find genuine woolly mammoth this time, so not the steppe mammoth. Um, the mammoths have evolved a bit since stage seven, and they are now fully fledged woolly mammoth alongside woolly rhino, again, different to the, the narrow nosed rhino that we saw in the interglacials and things like reindeer. So a very, very cold adapted uh, fauna, um, together with things like hyena and humans are still around at that time. So we'll now go to uh, one of these sites in the upper Thames that has gravels belonging to the Northmore Terrace, this part of the last glacial period. Um, and so there's a village by the name of Sutton Courtney um, that is about 10 miles south of Oxford, uh, near the modern course of the River Thames. Um, and it's in a gravel pit at Sutton Courtney that we had glacial gravels um, deposited in this lower part of the, the upper Thames. And these are some of the fossils that were found, again, by Kate Scott, who had led the excavations at Stanton Harcourt. And we've got some really lovely material that's just been donated to the museum from this site. And so you can see here we've got uh, an upper molar of a woolly mammoth here with all those many, many plates. Um, and this is a lower molar over on the right perfectly adapted for grazing on grasses in the, the, the mammoth grasslands that were around at that time. Uh, we also have some really great remains from woolly rhino. Uh, so we've got part of the, the humerus and part of the femur here. So the, the, the upper forelimb and the, the upper hind limb here. And uh, actually you can see there's some uh, rather intriguing marks along the edges of some of these bones, which is possibly suggestive that hyenas were, were gnawing some of the big mammal bones back in the last glacial period. Um, and we do have remains of hyena from the site too. Uh, and we have these lovely antlers from, from reindeer. And alongside the, the fossils, there have been lots of collections of uh, stone tools. And this is a rather important one. Um, so this is a type of stone tool called a leaf point, which is, uh, as you can see, looks quite like a leaf um, in shape. Um, but we only tend to find these kind of tools about 40,000 years ago, and that's right at the end of when Neanderthals were living in Britain, and right at the beginning of when uh, anatomically modern humans, so our own species, were moving into Europe. So these bones and these stone tools date to a really interesting period when uh, in human evolution. But there's no actually direct association of the stone tools and the fossils at this site, because uh, there was no excavation there. Um, the people were collecting fossils that were just being found during the, during the quarrying process. But there are sites in southern Britain where we do have direct association between the stone tools and the fossils. Um, and one of those is at uh, a site called Linford in Norfolk. And you can see we've got a, a map here, a plan view looking down on the excavation. Um, and you can see there's all these yellow bones belong to mammoth, woolly mammoth, and all these little red dots, you might be able to make out these tiny little red flecks everywhere. Those are all stone tools, individual stone tools. Um, so from this site that was excavated a few years ago now, um, they had over 1,300 fossils. 90% of those were belonging to woolly mammoth, and they had over 2,500 stone tools, all associated together and excavated. Um, and despite having all of those stone tools and all of those bones, there were very little actual evidence for direct exploitation of the, the large mammals at the site. So we don't have things like cut marks on the bones 
uh, and things like that. But given the, the, the close association, it's, it's long been suggested that this was actually a, a kind of mammoth butchery site. And there is some evidence. So you can see here we've got a tusk belonging to woolly mammoth and some of the stone tools, really nice hand axes from the site. There's some uh, evidence from the reindeer fossils uh, that the humans here were um, directly predating the, the animals. So these are some reindeer bones, and you can see this kind of fracture and, and impact mark here. So that's thought to be made by a, a tool when humans were processing the reindeer carcass. And we also have these uniquely shaped fractured bits of reindeer bone. Uh, and these are kind of spiral fractures, they're called, for the extraction of marrow. So it's likely that these bones were broken apart to get the nutritious marrow inside by early humans. There's some evidence from circumstantial, admittedly, but um, things like this, this is part of a, a mammoth rib bone. And it has these, you can see it's kind of swollen in the center here. And that's where the bone has actually repaired itself after being broken. Uh, and it's often in the ribs that we see this. So there, there were lots of rib bones of mammoth from this site. Um, and if you think about it, that's, that's where uh, Neanderthals would be thrusting their tools and spears into a mammoth to take it down. So it's been thought that uh, these kind of rehealed bones and, and fractures like this might be indicative of uh, human work at the site. So this is um, one of one of the reconstructions from from Linford, and you can see there's uh, some mammoths around the edge of this big water body with Neanderthals uh, processing a carcass uh, here. So this is what the the last the middle part of the last ice age would have looked like. Um, a really nice reconstruction. You can see we've got. Uh, Woolly mammoths, woolly mammoths, sorry, with uh, lions and bears, spotted hyena, wolves and horses, and uh, woolly rhino over here in the background, and humans obviously also in this landscape, but not, not highlighted in this picture. So and again, another unique combination of, of mammals that was around during the, the la last ice age. So we can add another unique set of uh, animals to the list um, from the last glacial. So. By tracing these sites back and having this really nice record through the River Thames, and especially up near Oxford where we are, we can see that there's been this changing cast of characters among the, the Ice Age beasts of Britain. So we've had unique assemblages like we saw at Stanton Harcourt about a quarter of a million years ago, where we have straight tusked elephant, but also together with this smaller bodied steppe mammoth and horse, uh, with Neanderthals also present. Then we go down to the, the last interglacial at the next terrace level, about 120,000 years ago, and we see a very different um, set of Ice Age mammals. So there's a new cast of characters on the scene. And this time we have uh, things like hippo, we have hyenas and together with fallow deer. But interestingly, no evidence whatsoever that humans were around in Britain at that time, despite the fact that we have loads and loads of sites of this age now. So quite interesting that humans didn't seem to make it back to Britain at that time. And then we go down to some of the youngest um, levels in the, the River Thames, and we see deposits from the last glacial period. And we have, uh, like we saw at Sutton Courtney and Linford, we have big woolly mammoth, um, big woolly rhinos. And actually the hyenas from this time are, are large bodied compared to the, the warm periods before. Um, and things like reindeer, and then the Neanderthals that um, would have been uh, butchering mammoths at Linford, um, or so people think. So that, that's a, a very brief tour through some of the Ice Age beasts of Britain. And hopefully I've been able to show that through individual sites like we have at Kirkdale Cave and, and Victoria Cave, but also at Bridlington on the coast, that each of those can provide a snapshot of the, of the British megafauna, of the British Ice Age beasts. But actually it's these kind of long, well-resolved well records like we have at the River Thames, where we can very nicely fit together a series of sites back through time that help us understand how these Ice Age mega beasts change through time. Uh, and there were, the, there were these unique assemblages of Ice Age mammals that came and went into Britain. And that's, that's not only things like the, the mammoths and these huge animals, but also includes humans as well as much smaller mammals. Um, things like voles and lemmings and that kind of thing that came and went during these different warm and cold periods. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to highlight the fact that everyone can contribute to our knowledge of the fossil record. So like that, that school pupil at Bridlington that found this wonderful mammoth molar with still parts of the upper jaw attached. Um, if you keep your eye out, you can also contribute to uh, our knowledge of the fossil record. So I'd like to just say a quick thank you to um, the Street Foundation, the Curry Fund, um, who have provided support for our project cataloguing the, the Ice Age mammals here at Oxford. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Daniel Shreve and Kate Scott, 
um, whose research I've mostly focused on uh, in the talk, but also my colleagues here at the museum, so Hilary and Eliza, have been amazing helping me through this project. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank the, the Fossil Festival organisers, and I hope you had a good time, uh, and particularly to uh, Liam and Jim for all their help getting this set up and running. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, and that's my uh, email address there, if you think of any later that you don't have now. So uh, thanks very much. Hope you've been, uh, enjoyed this brief tour through the Ice Ages of Britain. Uh, and yes, if you have any questions, feel free to, to let me know. Well, thank you very much. That was a, a fascinating talk. We have got one question through, but I'll start the ball rolling with a question. Well, it's kind of a question more of something of a statement as well. Is Kirkdale Cave, would you not agree, was a really pivotal point in geological history? Well, yes. not geological history, but in the study of geology. Mm. In the, it was from that point that the analytical viewing of fossil assemblies helped people interpret sites. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so if, I don't know if you've got anything to say about that. It's, uh... Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. So it was, it was around, it was a, a critical time in science in general at that, at that time when, when William Buckland first went, went, well, found Kirkdale Cave in the 1820s. And like you say, it was his kind of careful approach to analysing how the deposit actually formed that led him to question the idea that uh, you know, it was the biblical flood that had kind of washed all these things into the cave. And actually his, like I say, his careful kind of approach to the evidence and doing these kind of modern comparisons with modern hyenas and things like this that really paved the way to, for kind of scientific process in general. So it was, it was really important and, and uh, led to a lot of the theories that then went forward about the ice ages and just evolution in general. So a really critical place. Excellent. We do have a question from Caroline Lomas. Are there any sites we can visit? Oh, that's a good question. So a lot of these sites, like the ones I've shown you, actually, so the ones like Stanton Harcourt here in Oxfordshire uh, and the one like Sutton Courtney, they were old gravel pits that have now either been flooded or converted into other uses. So the Stanton Harcourt example was destined to become a landfill site and, and did. So all of the deposits there aren't accessible anymore, which is why the museum collections that are around the country, including ours, are for um, keeping track of what went on during the Ice Ages. But there are sites you can visit. So um, there are some sites, um, I'm thinking of one in particular that's of similar age to Stanton Harcourt. There's one called Marsworth down in Buckinghamshire, which has similarly, they found remains of mammoths and things like that, which are on display. You can see the Ice Age sediments, they've just done new exposure of the sediments at the site. So that's a, a really nice one to visit. But no, there are others as well. So I think you can go to some of these caves as well. There, there aren't, there's not much left because <laughs> they've been excavated for hundreds of years. Um, you can see these sites. So you can go to Kirkdale Cave. You can see the entrance um, where all these scientific discoveries happened. Um, but unfortunately, not much sediment left there now. Uh, I would also add that um, there's a lot of coastal places where you, these things, because of the, the Ice Age deposits that you get, on the coasts, so the East Yorkshire coast from Bridlington down the Norfolk coast and places like that, mm -hmm. there's things literally washing out of yes, the cliffs Yes, exactly, there, so. yeah. So you want to go after a storm when there's been a nice bit of erosion. And I think that's when the fossil hunters tend to go out. So I <laughs> get lucky and find, find some great things like that mammoth molar. So keep your eyes peeled on when on the coastal walks. <laughs> We have a, another question here from Susan. Is the lack of human evidence due to glaciation making the land inhospitable? That's a good question. Um, so yeah, during those glacial periods, it would not have been a nice place to be a, a human, a Neanderthal. Um, but curiously, for the for the stage five sites where we have those hippo remains and uh, like we have at Kirkdale and Victoria Cave, that lack of human occupation is quite strange because it was a it was a warm period. It was very similar to today, if warmer. Um, so it would have been a fairly good place for humans to be around in the landscape. But the interesting thing is that Britain used to be connected to Europe by a land bridge, which is how all these huge beasts came and went during the, the Ice Ages. But actually it's thought that at the start of that interglacial, sea level rose very quickly. So it's possible that humans just didn't make it to Britain in time, but they were here because they're here in, in the rest of Europe. So it's probably something to do with uh, sea level and, and that kind of thing that cut them off from getting to Britain, because it would have been quite a nice place, lots of things for them to hunt. We have another question here from Roger. Given a fragmentary fossil, how can one distinguish whether it is a different species or an anomalous example of the same species? 
That's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, and it's often very tricky for us to, to identify fossils when they are so fragmentary. Um, so like some of those bones that you saw, well, bones and teeth that you saw from the caves, they're quite well preserved. So it's quite easy to compare them to other fossils and modern animals and identify them quite easily. But no, when you have a fragment, it can be very, very tricky. So sometimes we're not, we don't assign them to particular species. We assign them to higher levels of uh, taxonomy, so the genus perhaps. Um, so we might just say that it was some kind of mammoth rather than particular species. Because if you just have a, a fragment of a mammoth tooth, you're not going to know what species it is because, uh, like I said, you, for the woolly mammoth, you have lots of those plates, so over 20 of them in a complete tooth. And in the other species that we see in Harcourt, you, you have far fewer of them. Um, but if you just have a fragment, you can't tell. So sometimes we can be more sure than, than other times. <laughs> Well, if anyone has got any more questions, uh, we'll give you a, a minute or so to type them in and I'll ask you another question. Something of a controversial one, but there has been theories that the current global warming is just part of the interglacial. Is there evidence from the other interglacial warm periods that what's happening now is significantly different to that? Mm. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's one reason why people are so interested in these past warm periods, because, you know, we can compare them to the current period we're in today and, you know, see what might happen based on evidence from the past. Um, and there have been studies that have tested exactly what you've, you've just asked. So they've, they've looked at other interglacials, they've, they've looked at how long they lasted before the next glacial period began, um, and they've applied that to the modern interglacial. And... Uh, according to some of that work, we should be on the way into um, another glacial period by now. So the climate shouldn't be warming, it should be cooling instead, if it were to be part of these natural cycles that we see going back in time. Um, so it's studies like that that have shown quite conclusively that actually what's happening now is not part of the cycles that we had seen for you know over a, over a million years. It's something completely different that uh, is almost certainly caused by human activity. Excellent. Well, we haven't had any more questions, but if anybody does, if they're more than happy to email them to you, if that's all right. Yes, and, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we'll wrap that up there. We'd like to thank you all for uh, coming along and hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you.